Good morning. Welcome to Pause to Pray. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. My name is Adam Schindler, and I am coming to you guys today from a place in, in Corinth, Texas, called Glory of Zion International. And this is a, a ministry of a fella named Chuck Pierce, who is interesting fella. And so I'm out here for a um, short little layover conference thing with my friend Becca Greenwood and her organization called SPAN. And I'm out in the garden in, I don't know, this prayer garden. There's Texas cows and things. It's pretty nice. There's some water over here, babbling brooks and whatever. But I am sitting here in the Israel prayer garden at Glory of Zion International. And I wanted to share this video with a couple of places and then talk with you guys all this morning about something. I am on the road and I am running a little crazy, but this thing has been in my heart. Um, I so appreciate every week uh, getting to listen to my wife um, share on her heart. And so today I'm gonna kind of piggyback a little bit on that out of the book of Hebrews and talk about learning obedience through suffering. Okay, so it'll be a great fun topic today about suffering. So good morning, everyone. Jumping on here. We got friends praying in from Indiana. Hi, Rosemary. Hey, Melody from Barnesville, Georgia. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining. Those of you, hi, Gretchen from the road, New Mexico to Texas. Great to have you all. All right, so I want to jump right in here today because I want to talk to um, our spirits, hopefully, today about suffering. And yesterday, my wife talked some about um, the enemy who has enslaved people all their lives with the fear of death and how God has come to conquer that and deliver them through all their lives, though they had been enslaved with the fear of death. And, you know, she's most definitely talking to me. And that's one of the deep things in my life that I've been terrified all of my life. And I've gone through ups and downs, you know, and believing Jesus for things and getting set free from depression and fear. Um, but there's been other seasons in my life where it's, it's been haunting, right? I know what's true about death, right? But all the evidence in the earth, if you look at natural things, tells you that death is final. That's the natural evidence. Now, there's a lot of spiritual evidence, and there is, I think, some natural evidence of what's after. But it's easy for the darkness to come in and tell you that's it, and that that is the most real, the most powerful, and the final thing that is true. And we know as believers that that is not the ultimate truth. That's not the deepest truth. Paul says in Corinthians that the last enemy to to be defeated is death. And then comes the end when Jesus turns everything over to the Father, the kingdom, right? The end is the, is the destruction of death and the giving of the entire project of the Son back to the Father. This whole thing that we're living in, in this beautiful prayer garden world that's both brought with beauty, pain, and suffering, all of this joy possibility is about sons and daughters coming to know the Son of God, so that everything can be handed back to the Father, so that there is a life everlasting, right? So I know the theology, right? I got good theology. But how does your good theology help you in your bad moments? When the weight of the spiritual darkness that's been unleashed on the earth over the last couple of years, when the weight of whatever is hunting or haunting you is crashing in on your soul, and, and holding on to your mind in such a way that you just can't faith your way out of something, you know? <laughs> so I wanna read you guys a scripture here and hopefully have maybe one coherent point uh, at some point along the way over the next 10 minutes. Um, I wanna answer that question by looking to the life of Jesus. And one of my favorite books to talk about the work in the ministry of Jesus is the book of Hebrews, because this writer of Hebrews, maybe Paul, probably Paul, I believe it was Paul, there's an argument amongst theologians, but this writer of Hebrews explains the priestly and kingly mantle of Jesus to a Jewish audience 
okay? And he roots it in the Old Testament scriptures, the promises, the covenants, but the fullness of what Jesus has done in the new covenant. So he talks about this, this character, Melchizedek, and I'm gonna read this little passage, tell you briefly about Melchizedek and make one point about suffering. So this is Hebrews chapter five, verse five. I think I put it in the description here as well. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, okay, which was a big deal uh, for a Jewish audience, okay? Who is the high priest? Who is the one anointed by God to lead us into the presence of God to atone for the sins that we don't know that we committed throughout the year and to bring us back into right relationship annually with God? Who is that high priest, right, in the Jewish mind? That's what, in a nutshell, what a high priest was. So Christ, verse 5, Hebrews 5, did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. Jesus didn't do this to himself. He didn't make himself a high priest. But he was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay? So God made Jesus a high priest. That links back to some stuff in the Psalms. It also links back to some of the ministry when Jesus was anointed or baptized by his cousin John and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Verse six, as it also says, but the writer, sorry, the writer of Hebrews is linking back to the Old Testament scriptures, primarily the Psalms here. Verse six. As it says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is this character that shows up in Genesis and he's the king of Salem, right? The king of peace who comes out. And I'm not gonna do a whole Melchizedek teaching. It's fascinating standpoint. Verse seven, in the days of his flesh, so when he was here on the earth, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. So Jesus, the writer of Hebrews is, is, is linking back to the places in the garden, you know, in that great moment on the night of his pressing before his betrayal, that he's crying out to God with tears and supplication saying, let this cup of the covenant, this thing, this imp impending death, this death that's coming to me, onto me. Jesus says, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. You know? So he said that Jesus was crying out to his Father who could have saved him from death. Right? And that's like, think about that for a second, y'all. Think about a son crying out to his Father with agony saying, save me from death. Save me, don't, save me. But in the same moment, like what that would do to a father's heart is just unbearably, I can't imagine that, right? This is an intense moment. But also the son then says, you know what? This is my longing because I'm scared but I am not choosing my own will, I know it's you. So it's not my will, but it's yours, O Lord, be done. And the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 5, 7 says that he was heard because of his reverence to save him from death, all right? And this is where we're gonna get to. How is Jesus saved from death? By not having to die? No, that's not, that's not salvation, you know? That's skirting around the inconvenient reality, right? He wasn't saved from death by not dying, okay? Verse eight, Hebrews five. Although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot we could say there, but I want to make one point about this. Jesus, although he was God's son, although he had the rights and the claims to cry out to the Father, to, to ask him in this desperation, don't let me or make me die. Although he was a son, he understood that he followed the word, the will, and the voice of his Father above his own. 
and that God saved him from death, not by keeping him from dying, but by bringing him back and ultimately defeating death in general. So the thing that's been in my heart right now, this last couple of days actually, is how do we learn obedience through the things that we suffer? Right? How do we learn obedience through the things that we suffer? And it's not like God causes the suffering, but y'all, there's something in the reality when we come face to face, particularly with the spirit of death and the fear of death, who for many of our lives, we've been held in bondage by that. And the earth is being held in bondage by the fear of death. And the promise to not have to confront death is get your vax, get your jab, get your booster, you know, do all this stuff, keep your kids covered, stay in your house, don't do blah, blah, blah. There's lots of things right now that we are being told that we can avoid the confrontation with death if we will just follow all of these rules, right? The fear of death is gripping people across the earth. You know, and I think actually that people are getting sick and tired of that. They're starting to realize, oh my gosh, people aren't dying from this and we're all gonna die anyway, but they're not dying from this. And why are we giving up so much of the things that we have valued for so long because we're afraid of death that is never coming, specifically from the pandemic. So before I keep ranting on that, I was thinking about learning obedience in moments of suffering. When God is saying, you know, and I, I've been in a dark place for the last six months and felt so much of what the earth is feeling and also getting assaulted myself. And I'm like, I want this to end. I want to get it. I want to get away from it. But I'm learning some obedience to the things that I'm suffering. How? It's like the prophet, I think it was, oh, I forget who it was, whether it was Elijah, I think it was Elijah, the one that prophesied to Naaman, the king who had leprosy, to go down and wash himself seven times in the river outside of his country. And Naaman got frustrated and he only did it a couple of times. You know, he was the king. And he was covered in armor and people couldn't see how bad his condition was. And he didn't want to go down and have to strip in front of all of his people so they could see all of the sickness riddling the king's body. That's one thing. The other thing was he was king and he didn't know how long this was going to take or what the deal was. So he was suffering and he got a word from the Lord. But in order to learn in his suffering, he had to learn through obedience because he didn't want to go and expose himself to his men so they could see the depth of his suffering and his hurt, right? And I feel like the Lord is saying to us, y'all, if you're hurting, if you're afraid of death, if you're scared, if you've got genuine problems, financial, physical, mental, spiritual, y'all, if you're suffering in some capacity, we don't get to skirt the confrontation with death and, and fear, right? The only way out is through. So how do we confront those things? Well, I believe that the Lord is giving and will give you clarity on how to follow his voice and what he's saying to you to face death, to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus and to gain victory and mastery. And even though you're a son and a daughter of God, Suffering's going to come to you, but death doesn't get you. And we will learn obedience through the things that we suffer. Now, like Naaman, however, it may require that the people around you that you love and that love you, they actually get to see the depth of what's going on in your life. That you can't pretend that you're not whatever it is. You can't pretend that you're not having constant lowered feelings that are resulting in anxiety, fear, and meanness in your house. You can't pretend that you're caught in a secret sin that you won't tell anyone about while your body and your mind begins to decay. You can't pretend. And it's not until we take off all of our armor, having said to the Lord, I'm sick, help, and he says, take off all of that protection, go and wash yourself in my word, and be restored, but you gotta do it seven times. You gotta follow with obedience. You gotta allow the people around you to see that you're hurting, and then everybody gets to watch the miracle.
This is what I believe, y'all. Part of what God wants in his children that are willing to learn obedience through the things that they suffer in the earth is so that the world gets to watch a miracle. So that the world gets to watch your healing and your deliverance. If they don't see it, they don't see you exposed and willing to follow God, then the world doesn't get to watch God's miracle. Just like the best example on the earth we, we got to see, because it was recorded in scripture, because Jesus didn't hide away from this, we got to read about a man who was facing his death, innocent of all charges, under excruciating terms, bleeding and begging his father not to let this happen. And yet he said, it's your will, not mine. And we got to watch that, and we got to receive it. Okay? So I want to pray now. I want to pray for anybody that is suffering um, that you would learn obedience. Not that God is trying to put his thumb on you because you're bad and you've got to learn to learn to obey, child. No. When we're hurting, we have to get out of ourself. To get out of ourself, we have to walk and speak according to another truth, not the one that's absorbing us, telling us lies. We have to get out of ourselves, walk another way, be willing to be vulnerable and exposed to God and those that love us and to receive our healing because Jesus has freed those who all their lives have been enslaved by the fear of death. And that's you and me today and we can be free. So let's pray for those that are suffering and then we'll pray for whatever else comes up. King Jesus, we thank you, God, that you are our eternal high priest, Father, and that you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, which is fancy Bible talk for a priest that isn't there because of genealogy or his genetics. He is there because God has appointed him forever a king of peace, the one who lives to make intercession for us. So, Father, we declare in Jesus' name that we trust you, Father, that we will follow you, especially in the times when all we can see is our own fear, when all we can see is our own doubt, when all we can see is the cloud of confusion that hovers over a nation. Father, we say in those moments in particular that we will listen and follow you only. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that the voice and the word of the Lord that is living and active, the rhema of God, would separate out soul from spirit in our lives right now, Father. That you would divide out the things that our emotions and all of our other chemical or biological environmental things tell us, the, the soul level thoughts from the things that are of the spirit. I pray God right now in Jesus' name for a division in everyone's mind that we could know what is a soul and what is a spirit. Not that either of those are bad sometimes, but we have to know the difference between the soul level feelings and thoughts and the truth about the things that God is speaking to us in the spirit. So Father, we ask for a division of soul and spirit, Father, that we could distinguish, Father, those two things and we could live by the spirit in the moments, God, when our flesh is weak and hurting and absorbed and consumed and self-focused, that we would live by the spirit Father, and that that spiritual life and truth, God, would begin to permeate, Father, our bodies, permeate our emotions, permeate the things that we think and feel as a subtext, low-grade tape that just plays in our heads throughout the day, that those things that play throughout our head in the middle of the day would come from the Spirit and not from the things of the flesh that lead us away from you sometimes. So, Father, we thank you that we can, by your authority, we have the power and the opportunity to cry out to you. Father, and that you have made a way for us to boldly approach your throne of grace in a time of need. So, Father, those of us that are hurting and struggling, Father, that are right now learning obedience to your voice through what we're suffering, we boldly approach your throne of grace and petition you for help in our time of need. Father, and we confess with our mouths and we believe in our hearts, not just that you're Lord, but that you reward your children who seek and pursue you. And so, Father, I ask in Jesus' name today for a reward for our faith. 
God, that everyone that's listening to this and agreeing with me here, Father, that you would give them the biblical reward of their faith that you promised in Hebrews 6, the reward of your presence. That it's impossible for us to pray and believe and come to you and not be rewarded because that's your character. So Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would reward us with an experience of your presence, a comforting touch of the truth of Jesus. Father, I ask that you would give your divine strategies right now in the place of suffering for people. Father, like a Naaman moment where he was told to take off his armor and wash seven times. Father, I pray for people that are suffering, Jesus, that you would give them a spiritual strategy. And whether it's a fast or whether it's, you know, Bible reading or whether it's personal meditation or, you know, whatever it is. Father, these aren't things that we have to do to get what we want. Jesus, these are things that you teach us how to do to lead us out of our own self-focused suffering and into obedience and understanding of you and receiving God of the healing and forgiveness. So we ask for understanding and divine strategies right now um, for the, the chemical and medical troubles that people are under. Father, that you, would, that you would set us free, Jesus, from this fear that holds us, and that you would heal the bodies in Jesus' name. You would heal the minds in Jesus' name. I do want to pray right now because I'm, I'm experiencing it. Um, I'm getting a little bit of freedom from it, but I want to pray for the lingering spiritual effects of COVID. You know, I recently got it, and I've, you know, I wasn't that impressed you know, wasn't that impressed with COVID. Um, it wasn't like a horrible physical thing, but I, I know some get it really bad. Um, but the thing that has, has troubled me is the, is, is the lingering effects and what that's done spiritually. I think that there are some very real lingering effects that get into the body and the spirit. I don't quite understand it, but I want to pray for the lingering effects um, that some of you have experienced a sickness through COVID that you know, the snotty nose and the chest pains and the, and the body aches have gone, but there's a heaviness that hasn't left you. And right now in Jesus name, I sever off the spirit of heaviness, the post COVID assault. I sever off that spirit of heaviness off of everyone that's had COVID that continues to feel this weight of oppression. We sever that now in Jesus name, according to the word and the power of God. I plead the blood of Jesus right now in your name, Father, over every person that's had COVID and is feeling these lingering effects of spiritual darkness. Your word says we have the authority to tear down strongholds and we command everything that has gotten built up during the period of pain and sickness in people's minds, all the inflammation in the brain and the neurological systems. We pray for release now in Jesus' name of that for the post-COVID sufferers, Father, and then a severing off final once and for all from the spiritual darkness that got attached to us as we were assaulted by these viruses. So I thank you, Jesus, for that freedom. I thank you, God, for, um, for deliverance physically, spiritually, and emotionally from the effects of COVID and the effects of all the other things that are getting brought into us through this. Jesus, I do just want to declare again my affection and allegiance to your voice and your word. And I thank you, God, that you do walk us through the valley of the shadow of death. And that the place that you've prepared for us for rest is not the shadow of death. It's a, it's a green pasture. So y'all remember, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but you'll walk through it. And then you lay down in rest and peace. Don't lay down, y'all. Don't lay down in the valley of the shadow of death, okay? Jesus will walk you through it, but you got to get up. Don't lay down. Okay, don't find a place of rest. Don't give up in that valley of the shadow. Okay, he is walking you through and you will see freedom. You will see deliverance. You will get the restoration that you're crying out for. This is a covenant promise of God that by his stripes, 2 Peter 2, 3, I believe, 2, 2, 2 something, 
that by his stripes we have been healed, quoting Isaiah 53, that he will heal us. Peter says we have been healed. This is a covenant promise that he will heal, set us free, break every chain, Melody, from post-anxiety and illness. He will do that. So Father, we receive that today. And whatever that is, whatever that is for the individuals that are watching, all of your precious sons and daughters uh, that love you, that you love, that are joining with us today. Father, I bless you. I bless you. Um, okay. I thought there was one more thing here. I'm going to do one more thing and then go back inside. Hebrews 5, verse 11. Um, 12, 13, and 14. About this we have much to say, which was Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek's a big deal in Hebrews, all right? So read that. About Melchizedek and what the king of peace, according to the eternal order of God, about this we have much to say. And it's hard to explain because you have become dull in your hearing. That's not a word. That's just the scripture. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Such a loving pastoral moment here. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. Okay, that verse. He's being kind, but he's also being like fatherly, you know? He's like, oh, Ive, I want to tell you more, but you're dull. You're dull because you're not consuming the meat, the depth, the truth. You're not allowing the things that you've suffered through to teach you about the power of the Father. Okay, there's so much about the Melchizedekian, God is our priest, he is the one that has made away stuff. When we really get that. You know, he's, and, and the writer is saying, look, you guys should have more than you have. Not to make you feel bad, but to say, look, you're not crying out for more. And if you, all you get is the milk, that you have an up and a down moment and you need a, a shot of adrenaline to make you feel better. You need to play Halo for six hours, Adam, so that you don't feel so scared and depressed. Like, that's so immature. Fun, but immature, right? That's milk. When you're hurting, don't drink milk. Go to the source, right? Because solid food is for the mature, the whole, the healthy. Who are the mature, the whole, and the healthy? These people. Those who have had their power of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay? That word trained by constant practice is the Greek word gymnazo. Okay? You got to take your powers of spiritual discernment to the gym, y'all. So that you can discern what's God and what's not what's truth and what's not. And you don't have that ability inside of you unless you're connected to life himself. Unless this is all nested under the king of peace, okay? Unless you are nested in the heart of the father and the power of the king of peace, the king of, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, Melchizedek, Jesus, unless you are connected to the father, you are not gonna have the maturity to take your spiritual discernment to the gym. Okay, but when you get connected to the King of Peace, you live through the things that you're suffering, then we as children, sons and daughters of God, have to constantly work out, through our connection to Him, the power of discerning good and evil. We have this power, y'all, when we're connected to the King of Peace. Okay, without Him, knowing good and evil kills us, right? Genesis chapter 2. But with Him, we're called to take our spiritual senses to the gym to learn how to do this. So y'all, you want to get big old spiritual biceps? If you're a guy, a lot of girls don't really want biceps. I don't know what the ladies want to make Jimmy. But we need our spirits to be strong. We need our spirits trained to discern good and evil. So you can be like my wife, who is immediately, she's a personal trainer, and she's like, oh, that's a, that's a lie from the devil. 
This is truth from Jesus. That's a lie from the devil. It drives me insane, but it's also the thing that I desperately need. I need a physical trainer. It's like, Adam, that's devil, that's devil talk. You know, we don't talk a lot about the devil in our house, but the devil talks a lot to us. Okay. And she's like, nope, that's, that's good. That's evil. Don't live in the evil, live in the good. Okay. Let's train ourselves to discern good and evil, life from death, Jesus from everything else, okay? And when you do that, we will live connected to the vine and we will not get pulled out from that place of in intimacy with the Father because the devil comes to lie, steal, kill, and pull us out. Yeah. So make us with huge spiritual biceps, Jesus, that we can discern truth and evil truth and falsity, good and evil. So Father, we ask that you would do that in us. You would teach us. You'd put us all on a spiritual training regiment, God. And Father, whoa, we have such an opportunity in this culture right now to discern good and evil. So Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would, that you would set everybody in a spiritual training system, Father, that we would be strong. Father, we would know, Father, and that we would go into situations intentionally so that we can train our senses to know good and evil, right from wrong, life and death. Father, and we thank you, Jesus, that you're beautifying and strengthening your bride right now in this hour and that she is getting strong and that she is getting courageous and she is eating from the deep things of the kingdom of God. She's eating meat and we know life and death, right and wrong immediately. We can see the difference. If you put this in your body, it brings death. If you put this in your body, it brings life. Down to that level of specificity, God, that you will show us. Because the FDA and the CDC and the government organizations don't want us to live in life. They want us to live under fear of death. But Father, you know the path to life. And you will show us. And we ask for that. And we thank you for training us. We bless you, King Jesus. We thank you, living God. I worship you today, Father. We thank you for this beautiful garden and this glory of Zion ministry out here in North Texas. Just bless you, Jesus. Thank you for my friends on Million Voices. We love you, Daddy, and we pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Well, thank you, y'all, for joining with me. If you haven't, please go to millionvoices.org and get connected to what we're doing. We've got lots of great weekly content. We've also built a tool so that you can speak up and reach out to your state representatives with a handwritten note. Um, it's statistically shown that if 15 people will contact their state legislator on a single issue, they get their attention. Okay, and so we've built a tool to give you the names of your state legislatures, give you ways that you could write out, and if you want to contribute $19.99 a month, we'll send a postcard in your name to your state re representatives every month on issues that matter to you. So go to millionvoices.org, get connected to what we're doing. Thank you for praying with us. Thank you for being salt and light. Thank you for loving Jesus. It is, these prayer times are solidarity, y'all. Their solidarity, their intercession, their Bible study. I just love them. It's been such a blessing. Love you guys. God bless you. Shabbat shalom. Enjoy your weekend.